Hello everybody, thank you very much for sticking around, we've got a really good, interesting 45 minutes here. Uh, we're going to get into the world of gaming, uh, TV, find out how you guys can make the most of these two uh, colliding worlds in the best way possible. Um, I just want to quickly run through each of you guys and uh, discuss how you deeply involved in gaming you are. We've got some, got some of the panellists are really involved, some people less so. Uh, let's start with yourself, Emmanuel, at Media One. Tell us a little bit about what you do for Media One, but also the, the moves you're making in gaming. Yes, well, for Media One, I'm a buyer, so I'm an acquisition, working on acquisition for distributions. So I finance and buy TV series to distribute them worldwide. Um, so, and about gaming, I might be the one who, who, who is the least involved into gaming, but I'm really involved into IPs. Mm. The group is developing right now one or two games, show, well, one or two TV series based on gaming shows, but uh, besides the gaming shows, it's all re really about IPs and how we adapt and transform uh, what uh, a story already existed to a TV series. Good stuff. And yeah, that's something we're going to really dive into, that IP element of it. Yes. And, uh, and yeah, how gaming provides a nice uh, segue into that. Uh, Ellen, you're very much in the gaming world, but I am. Uh, increasingly in TV as well. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about what, we, what you do for Ubisoft, and, and perhaps just briefly do some sure. name dropping, if you would, in terms of the games that you've uh, been All right. <laughs> uh, so Ubisoft is the home to uh, Assassin's Creed, that some of you might know, or the rabbits, which are those crazy little rabbit white things <laughs> that your kids might know and you might hate, um, but they are great fun. And in, I think, over 11 years ago, we started transforming some of those IPs that we had built into movies and TV series. We released some good TV series, some so-so movies. <laughs> We're learning. Uh, so Assassin's Creed was the first movie we released a few years back. Uh, we have four seasons of the Rabbids TV series. We just released an um, uh, anime uh, for adults on Netflix, Captain Laserhawk, a Blood Dragon remix. It's a kind of a medley of some of our main uh, characters. And we have a lot of plans for the future. As we know, gaming is more and more very important IPs in this world. Great stuff, thank you. Uh, Peter, tell us about NatCon and, and yeah, the other... Nat, NatCon and games, yeah. So I'm more the student here, so I want <laughs> to learn something and to find out. For me, it was always very important to be, let's say, on the top of the, the crowd, so to, that's my job. So to find out what is interesting, what, where are the trends, where things are moving. So film needs a lot of time. So that means when you're starting late, you're very late. So. You should be ahead. I have done 30 years ago the first interactive TV drama that has worked very nice. That was like a video game with very simple methods. At, at this time, the, the head of the TV channel, so it works with the Tila commander, he told me, Peter, I could not really enjoy it because we don't have a Tila commander at home. So that was the time where people go to the TV set and check the channel. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's important to understand this, and I work a lot with IP, so I have filmed many books, and so the transfer between literature and the adaptation of literature, and so the adaptation of games is very interesting, I think, and mm -hmm. opens a lot of possibilities. Great. Uh, and Frank, obviously, we were talking in the, uh, earlier, you worked on an X-Files game back in the day. Uh, so you've been working in games and, and TV series for, for quite a while, but yeah, just give us a brief uh, pressy of your uh, career as well, if you would, and, and the gaming-related elements of it. Yeah, I, I wrote the X-Files video game back in 1998, <laughs> so it's the 25th anniversary, I guess. <laughs> um, and then uh, I've done a lot of adaptations, but the only video game that I've adapted as a writer and producer uh, for my company Big Light in London is uh, based on Warhammer, uh, and there's a character in the Warhammer universe known as Gregor Eisenhorn, an Inquisitor. And I've spent, gosh, it's been five years now that I've been involved in the development of that. But that, the entire Games Workshop IP has now, uh, they made a deal with Amazon and Henry Cavill. So Eisenhorn is now wrapped up in that, in that uh, deal, and we'll see when it comes out. It, it, the constellation of series and movies they're going to do, um, it'll be part of that. Good stuff. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So the, the common theme between all of us is uh, the IP element of it. It's a real good way to sort of cut through the noise and you've got an engaged fan base straight away. 
a very engaged fan base in many cases. Helen, you know all about those, uh, the gaming side of it and that, that fan base. For Ubisoft, what's the, what's the sort of driver for getting more involved with TV? Because, I mean, gaming is a giant business. You're making billions and billions of dollars through gaming. TV probably is smaller fry, I guess. It, it is. What's the upside for you? The margins in TV, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Compared to video games. <laughs> no, honestly, um, for us, it's a, it's a way of engaging new audiences also. Because you, you have, l let's say, um, in, in a couple, you might have very stereotypically um, a, a man that has been a gamer all his life. Women are getting there. It's 50% of the gaming population right now. They just don't play exactly the same kind of games. But for us, it's also a way to share a common love because we know how engaged people can be into their video games when they love it. Mm -hmm. But you left your partner or parents or on the side and they felt left out. Um, Getting the IPs into the world of TV and movies is also a way to bring more people in that world because a world in video game is absolutely gigantic and you can spend two hours of gaming in there without ever doing the same thing. Um, that's huge and there's so many stories embedded into a video game. Mm. that we know, uh, but what we lack most of the time is emotional connection with the characters. We're getting better at writing stories within gaming, but it's never been the most, the easiest or the best thing we've done. So getting those to, to translate into video game, into uh, movies or TV series is allowing us to bring some depth and also to extend the number of hours that people want to play with those characters. They want to know their background, they want to know what they're thinking and not just what they're doing when they're playing them in the video games. So that's kind of what we're looking for. And talk to, I mean, perhaps some people in the audience might not know, sort of, you know, if they've got an idea, I mean, in terms of the way that you're working with TV producers, how does that relationship work? You know, in terms of if, if you've, got, you've got a piece of IP for one of your games and the producer thinks they've got a great idea, how? How, do the, how are these worlds colliding? So there are several ways. Either uh, this producer is like a big fan of that game and has an idea for that specific IP. Mm -hmm. And then we listen and we say, okay, that's a great idea, let's do it. Sometimes we go and we go to a certain, um, for example, a scriptwriter, or when we do animation, we go to an animation director that has, and ask them, like, would you like to work with those IPs? Because we love what you've done in the past and your vision. And the, the way it works the best is when either they've played, if they grew up with that IP, then it's perfect. Or um, they're like, ooh, I'm inspired by that, and then we work together on it. Uh, that's one of the way we, we work today, but we can also, uh, the idea is not, uh, video game is becoming one of the biggest part of pop culture. And so what we do is we try also to, to uh, be relevant uh, to that pop culture and to what gaming actually is in people's life. Mm -hmm. So gaming is not only about the IP. Gaming is a business, so you can see a lot of business stories. Mm. You know, unscripted and mm -hmm. shark tanks about video games, sure. Mm. Um, it's, it's, of course, IP's world that are specific. You can talk about history. You can talk about the hacking. That's what we have. So you actually have so many things that are all encompassing in video games. It's a huge chest, and we can do also originals as long as they talk about video game or about esports or about, I don't know, a romance set into people that met through esports. That's a great story yeah. for Ubisoft. Good stuff. Yeah, really interesting mm. that. Um, the, and I think you did, didn't you have, there was some element of a, a show that was based on Ubisoft's office or something. The oh, we did. We created um, a, a story whose original uh, series, whose original idea was created by Ubisoft, which is called Mythic Quest. It's an yeah. Apple TV series. We've done four seasons. It's an office comedy, really, with yes. Rob McElhenney. Uh, but it's set in the world of video games, and so we came up with the idea, and Rob McElhenney thought it was really interesting, and brought it to Apple, and created and showrun it, and it's about a video game company trying to make video game and dealing with the fandom that's yeah. really, you know, they can be scary sometimes, yeah. and um, <laughs> uh, this is, they're so involved in what we're doing, and it's showing an, another side of the business that we didn't know before. I think it's a really nice indicator of how entrepreneurial and sort of opportunistic as well, uh, perhaps you guys have been. Um, Emmanuel, I want to talk yeah. to you about your project that you've got, because uh, it's fairly nascent at the moment. It was only released, or revealed at least, a couple of months ago. Tell us about the, yeah, the ways that you're moving into gaming and, well, and that project. It's mainly uh, from producers. At first, it's really 
as uh, it was said, it's really about producers and visions. Yep. So me as a distributor, I'm really uh, trying to help as much as I can to, to find the financement and find the, and find the way to do the, the show. Mm. So, but the Media One group is all, also, all, all, of course, all looking for IPs. And in those IPs, there is video games. So we are developing one video game in France, named Plague Tale, but uh, that's very, very early stage. And we are looking for more, mm. obviously, because we are looking for more IPs to attract more viewers and maybe younger viewers also, which is one of the big assets of the video game. Yeah, and because, I mean, we've got this, there is a correlation between people who play games and people who watch shows on streamers, so that's good for streamers, but then also if you're a broadcaster, perhaps you might be thinking you know, there's a way potentially to lower your audience, I don't know, maybe that's pushing it too far. It all depends on the adaptation. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's, now the broadcaster wants to attract more younger viewers or make them come back. Yep. Uh, so that's interesting for, for them, and all depends on the, the way you, you, you do the, 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 the show. It can be with a lot of violence or not. It could be more like The Office or more than Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on the, on the way you, 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 you do it. Yeah, and, and the, we, so we've got the IP that's going to cut through. One of the things that we've also seen is the, the characters in video games really, you know, the, we were talking earlier about the, the way that the, the, the people who are creating these games, uh, you know, the, the quality of script writing is really improved. Um, the characterization is really improving as well. Uh, Frank, let's talk to you. You're a man all about character. That's sort of your uh, focus as a, as a script writer. But something like Warhammer, I mean, talk to us about that, because with that type of game, you know, A, it was a board game first, then video game is becoming a bit of a franchise within and of itself. How do you go about taking that bit of that IP that everybody knows Warhammer, or most yeah. people might know Warhammer, how do you take that through and, and then create a, a video, a, a TV show out of that? So, I mean, our business is obsessed with IP, and everybody wants IP as insurance, right? It's going to be more likely to be commercially successful because it's already worked as a book or, you know, as a comic book or as a video game. But in the case of a video game, there isn't necessarily a narrative or even a clear character. And so I look at adapting a video game as a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you're going to attract the natural interest of the audience for that video game. On the other hand, if your interpretation of it doesn't honor their fandom, they're going to hate you with a burning passion. <laughs> and you need to make it work for them. It absolutely has to work for the fan base for the game. But if it only works for the fan base of the game, you also fail. So you have to find a way to be true to the core DNA of the game, but also widen out that appeal for a general audience. So with the case of Warhammer, what's interesting is it's a company called Games Workshop in Nottingham, England. And everybody who works there loves their product. They are genuinely like obsessive fans, of, which is a wonderful environment to be in. And it's very inspiring going up there. And I was able to have a lot of conversations with them because it's, it's a bit overwhelming. If anybody here knows Warhammer, it's, it's a giant universe with thousands of characters and many, many types of aliens and, and a, a narrative that spans thousands of years. And so to even find an access point is a bit intimidating. But being able to talk to them and get a sense of, is this what, is this, does this feel right? Is this who this character is to you? And is this what this is about? And starting to feel like I have confidence about how to adapt this game into a narrative for television. Um, and I, now, like I said, I've been doing this for five years, so now I feel like I certainly haven't mastered, but I feel some level of comfort and confidence um, about what the world is, and I understand why they love it. Because really, if you're going to adapt it, you have to love it too. Like, you, you can't fake that as a storyteller. Mm -hmm. You have to genuinely find that point of connection and passion for it as well, because it, it can't come from a place of cynicism. You know, the audience knows this is just a money-making thing. This is just a marketing thing. And nobody wants that. They want a story and characters they can really fall in love with. And I think, I mean, Peter, let's, you've done lots of novel adaptations. So you're very well versed in that kind of world. What's your take? You know, if you're looking at taking IP, you know, the world of, 
a book uh, optioning at the moment, I don't think probably has ever been hotter. I'm not sure there's a book out there that hasn't been optioned. Yeah. Um, so when you're sort of looking at new avenues, what do you make of games and, uh, yeah, sort of exploiting that route? Well, I mean, you kind of have to go where the money is in this business, right? It's like if people are willing to invest in IP and in a game, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there for that, but I've got to find what is it I love about this. And, mm. you know, what was a really big learning experience for me was this book, The Man in the High Castle, which is a Philip K. Dick novel that I agreed impulsively to adapt for television, having read it in college. And then after having made the deal, I went back and read it again and realized this book has no narrative, really. And, well, gosh, how do I adapt this then into a TV show? And what I did in that case, which I have applied to Warhammer and many things now, is I identified what to me were the themes that were important to Philip K. Dick. What is this book about? Not what is the story, because the story wouldn't work for television. What are the themes? And then I cr constructed a narrative for television that I thought was <coughs> consistent with Philip K. Dick's intentions. And then when the series came out, the reviews were, wow, this is so faithful to Philip K. Dick. And it wasn't at all, <laughs> but it felt faithful because mm. I was honoring, you know, his vision uh, in a television narrative. And so I, I think that's my advice to anybody who's, you know, adapting a game or a book or anything like that is really get to the core of it and, and make sure that you feel like you're in touch with the author's intentions and what the fans love about whatever it is you're adapting. And, and Peter, I mean, you've, yeah, you, you've adapted a lot of novels as well. When you're sort of looking at it as a new or a potential avenue for, for IP, how do you approach it? Are you, are you, are you seeing opportunity <coughs> in games? That what Frank said is very true. Mm. And the thing is, okay, everybody wants IPs, so that is proof of this insecurity in this business, so that we suffer a lot from this. Mm. So in every speech, people say, we are open for the new. No, nobody is open for the new. <laughs> nobody wants to see this. They all want the old, proved, right. <laughs> and the IP is, is the best yeah, to yeah. have this. And no, I was always more fascinated in stories because there are not so many good stories. And I read a lot. And in a way, it's obvious there are more good stories on the book market. So. So sometimes you have great stories in original scripts, but in the end, from the quality, a book story is very often better. And then, yeah, you have to deal with this because for the writer, so they are, they are all complicated persons. Uh, I love to deal with them, so it's in very interesting. <laughs> One of the, my, my favors in this job that I could be a literature agent. And they're all different, but the key thing is they give their book as a child in a boarding school. So hmm, they feel bad. So they delivered it, and you as a producer, a writer, as the one, okay, will they treat my boy good? So will he come? But then, when you change the format, so then you have to be independent. So I would always tend to have a, a contract with a writer where he has nothing to say. So yeah, that you would never do this. <laughs> they're different. So some they don't want this, some they are eager, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's always dangerous. And that, what Frank said, is true too. So you have to, because the people feel when something is wrong, so you cannot cheat them. So you have to get the idea of something. And let's say one of the perfect adaptations is definitely Harry Potter. So because the books are very special, it took very long till somebody understands that they were interesting. Yeah. And the films are in a way different, in a, but in, in, in the core, they're very truthful with the idea of this book. Mm -hmm. And that is the key thing. And what interests me in video games is that I make the experience that, <clears throat> let's say, it's easier to work with a bit trashy, so the English say uh, station literature. So, yeah, so, so it's, it's very often better material, short stories, mm. to t make films out of this. And it's definitely very difficult, and I've spent a long time in developments when you have big novels. Yeah. yeah. So, so in this world, so that means that makes a transfer from story to to another format in a way sometimes easy. Yeah. But then you have to take the material. You have to be faithful with the idea. But in the format, you have to change it that it works better. So as Frank said, so it's true too because when you you read a novel again, so time is uh, a traitor, and. Uh, 
Then you find out, okay, where is the story? There is no story. So th you had a feeling when you read it first. Mm -hmm. but I have experienced this very often. So mm -hmm. in, and it's in this... When, when we did the, the adaptation of Millennium, which was a big book at this time, so in the, in the first approach of a writer, so he wrote this girl, this hacker girl, out. So I was thinking, okay, that is, for me it was very clear that the key thing was this character, mm. this girl. So, so, so when you make out of Millennium a detective story, whereas in the lead a, a journalist, and you take this side character, this hacker girl, yes. <laughs> this <laughs> Uninteresting. Yeah. <laughs> so then, yeah, you are not faithful with the book. So that means in the end, nobody remembers so much Mikhail Newstream's great part in this as a journalist. So everybody is focused on this girl. So, and that's interesting. I it, think. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I think, and that's what I learned already now, is that for video games, yeah, this emotional power is very important mm. so, and, and, and difficult, maybe, yeah. Yeah, because the film is easier. To, to get over to the people. So a movie works when people are crying. So then, yeah. So that is the way when you come through this layer of context. Mm -hmm. That's maybe for video games harder to, to make. That's, the format is different. And, but that is, I still think they will be getting better and better there. Yeah. I think, I mean, we saw with The Last of Us was an interesting, you know, kind of a breakthrough moment, probably, arguably. I mean, uh, Helen, because we've seen quite a few adaptations. It's not like that was the first adaptation. No. Perhaps before that we saw quite a few adaptations that didn't quite work, mm -hmm. um, including Assassin's Creed. I mean, it'd be interesting to sort of get your take on, on that show and, and why that didn't particularly work and you know, what, what were the lessons that we've been learning from that? And I, I think what, what Peter and Frank said is very interesting because the, the story isn't obvious in video games. Mm. And in books, it's obvious, apart from uh, the man in the high castle. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and so, of course, it makes the work of adaptation much more difficult, because you have to find your story. Yeah. Or you have to find a story that talks to everybody that has been playing the game, knowing that each of the person that has been playing the game has a different story with the game. Because each of them is the director. And you, you cannot choose where they watch at what time. You cannot choose if they're going to go to A, B, C first, or the, other, the opposite, and then how do you adapt the story to that? So that's why um, there was a whole video game based movies and TV series that are, or movies are not uh, new. There were uh, quite a few in the 90s. Mm -hmm. They haven't been good for the reason that you explained and I'm glad someone like Fern can take that and make it into something. That will be great, I'm sure. Uh, because what happened is Hollywood was like, ooh, IP, I want that. I'm going to slap it. Uh, make something, it's licensing, and you use it as if it's, li it's licensing. And it doesn't work because you're not, you're, you're making a story that doesn't necessarily make sense with whatever is the core of the experience of the gamer. Which is, which is why, Frank is explaining, it took him five years and he still has to ask to people that have spent those thousands of hours in the Warhammer world what it feels like. Is it right? Am I wrong here? And mm -hmm. I've been working for, in the video game industry for 25 years and still, if I haven't played that game, I will definitely refer to all the people that have played it. And what happened is there's a new generation of decision makers in Hollywood, but even more importantly, of script writers that have grown up with video games and that are excellent. And this is probably why something like Last of Us became very good. And I can say the very first one was probably Castlevania in the animated side. Um, League, um, Arcane, which is a League of Legends, they were very well written because they were written also by people that cared and played those games. And Last of Us was the one that was the most mainstream, mm -hmm. because it's live action, so of course watched by m many more people. Um, the reason why it was so well done uh, is also because two things, I would say. One is because it's a very unique type of video game that's heavily <coughs> story-driven. And the intention of the creator was probably to make it like a movie, because for the longest time, video game was try were trying to be like movies. Mm -hmm. Now it's the other. Yeah. Uh, and, and so he, it was a very story-driven uh, game to start with, so that's a little bit easier. And um, what happens also is that Craig Mazin, the showrunner, um, was a big fan of Last of Us. And he kind of was, yes, his pet project, I want to be doing that movie, and that's the one I want to be, uh, TV series, that's the one I want to be doing next. 
And since he had done Chernobyl before, and by the way, he worked on our series also because he's a huge gamer, he was in the, in the writing room, um, studios execs said yes. And because studios execs, even though they're not yet the one that are playing the games, they have kids mm -hmm. that are huge fan of games and they know the power and they know the number of hours their kids are playing on Assassin's Creed, on Fortnite, on Roblox, and they know there's something there that's really beneficial for them. So that's why we've seen a shift in this industry from the 90s kind of shitty movies to, the, um, to what it is today, where it's mm. really the bar has come up. And, and then sometimes you just realize, like, Assassin's Creed was coming from a place of heart and respect. Truth is, the story was, just wasn't good enough. Storytelling still is at the heart of a, a very good TV series and a very good movie. We know how to make excellent game at the time. We didn't know how to make excellent movies. Yeah, we're learning. Very interesting. Yeah, uh, Peter, you want yeah, to say? It was just one. I said, sorry, I, I'm a student. Maybe this is naive, be, because what we learned in storytelling in film is is uh, to bring an an actor and character in moments where you have to decide, and in this decision you can create the the character. So that's very simple, but very difficult. So when you have scripts, you have characters mm -hmm. which you have in description and very little in action. So far as I understand, more as a watcher than as a player, many video games, even the sport games, so it's all about decision. And so that means, do I throw, or do I block, or do I pass? In the basketball <coughs> sport game, or even in my first version, it was a decision to stay with the channel or move. So I think it might be interesting when you, when you Con to, uh, when you connect this character building a bit more with the decision structure. So, yeah, so in a, that you bring characters in situations where the player can decide, do I kill him okay. or not? Yeah, so which is a big question. So when you remember, and I don't want to talk about my stuff, but in the killing, the very end was that this father find out who was the murderer of his daughter. And it was a big thing, and I loved this in the story, that we did it as a controversial, that he has to decide, do I kill him or take the police? And he killed him. Uh, Spoiler. Yeah, so... Spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> and so when you could bring this a bit more in this writing, developing in of video games, I could imagine that you can work more with character and maybe get deeper in these feelings with the character. Mm. So you can even see that a character makes a bloody mistake and that drives him in the, on a trip, which is bad. Yeah? So when you have a story, so you always find there was a, a moment when Valdemar <laughs> you come on the wrong track. So, yeah. I think well, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, we were discussing before, you know, if you've, you guys have played certain games, you get really attached. I mean, I was talking about Red Dead Redemption too. Like, mm. you know, you, and you end up playing that character for... God knows how long, you know, too much of my life was lost in that, but it was, uh, you get really engaged and connected to that, that player. But, and then when you're, when you're taking those characters and when you're working, you know, these are prized assets of yours, yeah. prized characters that have been created within a gaming uh, environment, and, you know, then you might work with someone uh, like Emmanuel. Yeah. How, how closely do you guys work on, on the, the storytelling for the TV show? Is there, you know, is there constant coordination, or do you kind of just say, well, here are the rights and don't mess it up. How? Oh, so that's how much? also one of the reasons why we went from a, an era where video game based movies were doomed um, to now is because most of the uh, video game IP owners have started creating their own production companies. So we did that years ago. Mm -hmm. But PlayStation production, they did Last of Us, they did Twisted Metal, they did um, uh, Uncharted are an excellent example of that and why nobody, we don't do that anymore if we want actually to make something good in TV and movies. They, they are part of Sony, PlayStation Productions, yet Sony is not making the movies based on the PlayStation IPs. PlayStation Productions is, mm -hmm. because they understand gaming. Yeah. They happen to have a great partner in Sony Pictures, but Sony Pictures is not controlling that. And they come up with their story and their development. They go pick the artists they want to work on the IP. And they, they put the package together and they probably follow the production. Um, and that is a big change also. It's like whoever is at the wheel is someone that deeply cares about those worlds, understands them, and knows where they want to bring them. And it makes a difference in the quality of the end product, mm. I think. 
And, another, and, and connected to that question, I guess, we've also seen, you were talking about the script writers, you know, and uh, their work, I mean, the, the increasing sort of, you know, the, the worlds have collided quite a lot. You also, the, the, the screenwriters who are working on, or I don't know if what you call them, screenwriters, the people who are coming up with the, the stories within games yep. uh, are, you know, the a Hollywood talent. Um, and that, so this is almost a virtuous circle. We can see, you know, you've got top screenwriters who played games, developing uh, games for TV. Are they also creating character in, in new games? Are you finding that the talent that is coming in on on new games being developed is sort of increasing a more focus on characterization and that definitely, type of thing as well. Definitely, and now when we're when you're hiring people to actually write the games, we go and hire people that have been working on successful TV shows, which we couldn't touch before because they were like, eh, video game, that's for geeks. <laughs> <laughs> but now they're like, video games, yeah! <laughs> I grew up with those. So it's a very different circle also, and it's only getting better because it is a medium that matters to more and more people, more and more talented people, and they want to be able to write a 360 story, story just like they consume 360 media. Yep. They, they, they play video games, they watch YouTube, they, they go to movies, yep. and you, you need like a premium movie, but also some little YouTube videos. As a consumer of entertainment, I do all of this, and I don't... I, there's no ranking of, ooh, this is bad, this is good. It's just, it's part of my life, and I have a moment for each of those. So do they. And so a talented writer will be happy to go, hopefully, into yeah. every single step of where they've been consuming their own entertainment and yeah. their own taste. So we were able to get better and better writers, and that's great for this industry. Yeah. But in, in a way, it's a little bit like, like 20 years ago when we spoke about feature film comparing to TV series. At that time, when we talk about TV series, it was not that good. Maybe 25 years ago, and now it's not the same. So, video game, it's the new TV series area, and where we all the creativity might be, and mm. so we need to adjust and uh, and see how we can work all together. I mean, yeah, I wanted to talk to you, Emmanuel. On the, you know, you're you're the money man. You're you're helping to get these shows <laughs> yeah. you know, financed and on, on the screen. You're speaking to the commissioners and the people yes. who are going to buy these shows as well. How are you finding demand? You know. In, for, for producers out there in the audience who might be, you know, mm -hmm. an idea, what is the demand like from the from the buying side? You know, when you're talking to Netflix it's huge, set. huge demand of IPs, first in IPs. There's two two things. There is how to 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 adapt an, an IPs and how to adapt a video game. Video game has this very interesting things is that it might attract younger viewers. Once again, it's all what the network wants, wants, to, wants to do. Streamers, it's okay, but the near networks really wants to attract younger viewers mm -hmm. because no one under 50 is looking at TV anymore. So yeah. they want to attract them. And so the demand is huge from the streamer and the broadcaster. Um, and so they really need the producers and creators to, to work on it and find a way to adapt uh, some IPs. And in a way, video game and TV series are, or feature film, are the same in a way because they are, uh, they create some great characters and they create a new universe. Mm -hmm. the, all, the main difference is the point of view. And in the video game, you are part of the, of the show. <coughs> you are, and on a TV series, you are just watching. But you can be so intimate with the characters yet at one point, you are also part of the show. And that's, what, that's also why, I know that there is a connection, but also why many new TV series uh, has, uh, has broken the fourth wall, meaning when characters talk to the, to the public. That's maybe also a reason, because just to, to see, okay, we are like you. We, we, we want to attract you, like a video game, when you are, uh, you are the, the one who will, who will decide. And when in, I don't know, Fleabag or other show, when they talk to the audience, when they break the fourth wall, that also means, okay, we all in this together. Yeah. That might be a consequence. I'm not, not sure because the fourth wall have, have been broken years before. But still, maybe it's... It's an interesting, yeah, well, thing to explore. Yeah, yeah. Please say, yeah, you <laughs> No, it's obvious. The key thing is the interaction. So that's the difference, yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, so that means... Where an older generation is, when, when I do my adaptation, it's an interpretation. So, and you watch this because it's entertaining, maybe it's educating or it has something. 
And this younger generation obviously don't want to sit and watch, they want to do something. Yeah. So they, they want to interact with this. That's, that's the idea. And, 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 and that's the point, and, yeah, and that is maybe the difference. Yeah? So but that's the difference between TV, for example, and game world, yeah? because yeah. TV is entertaining, so that's it. Yeah? And uh, so, so that means the connection there is not so easy. Yeah, so yeah it's a different... Because it's two different things that work in, in, in different worlds. Mm. The question is maybe interesting, why the jungle generation is so much on this interaction? Yeah. Because on the other hand, maybe there is a lack of communication. I don't know. So you have a feeling that, yeah, because there is definitely less communication than, than in former time, I think. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Or um, less direct communication. Yeah, different mediums yeah? perhaps. So which yeah. is more media control. So it could be a point that therefore this, let's say, faked interaction, which is a video game definitely, mm -hmm. It's sort of, let's say, an interesting surrogate, yeah. Yeah. To for younger. In a way, our our business is all, always a mirror, or the anti mirror of our society. And if in the society we are lacking some sort of communications, that's why maybe younger viewers wants to, to have it into the video games. I don't know, it's more a sociological yeah. point of view. I'm not sure about it, but, uh, <laughs> but our business is really related to the, to the, to the society. Yeah. And so that's... Yeah. But I mean, the interesting bit, and it, that segues nicely uh, yeah. into... I just wanted to touch on the, the reversal of this process, because we're not just seeing video games getting turned into TV shows, we're seeing TV shows becoming video games, Netflix has made a huge push into that. Different type of business perhaps and different reasons perhaps, but I mean ultimately it's about creating that sort of 360 uh, yeah. environment. Uh, Elena, I don't know, I mean for a gaming company such as yourselves, are you looking at that as an opportunity as well or is that, you know, is, is there potential there? <coughs> yeah, we actually today we're releasing uh, an Avatar video game. Mm. Um, that is telling a different story than the Avatar movie from James Cameron. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the elements of the game we've been doing based upon that creation would end up being part of the movie, number mm. three, four, five, whatever <laughs> James Cameron will do, because it is world creation. And if James Cameron is, is anything really, is a world creator, and mm -hmm. video games is just that, world creation, for most of it, for the bigger game. And so whatever we create in the world, we, if, if the quality is high enough, you can then insert it back into a movie or a TV series. Mm -hmm. That has happened also with Harry Potter. Hogwarts mm -hmm. Legacy was so good that Warner said, oh, maybe we're gonna make a movie out of that because it was so well received. So like it's a full loop where yeah. the video game is just another way of building what we call the lore, mm -hmm. when we talk about the world. and can then become, comes and feed back into the more, the bigger universe of, that the movie has created, or the opposite way around. It's just a, it's a starting point of building a world and, and placing emotionally interesting characters in it. Whether you start with movie, TV series, or gaming, you can end up feeding the whole uh, transmedia world after that. Yeah, and the, I mean, we've obviously got some huge IPs out there that you know, many of them have already been adapted. Are there, are there still sort of gems yet to be unearthed? You know, I mean, some of these, you know, some, especially some of the games perhaps that are, you know, on your phone or something like that. You know, we saw Angry Birds, for example. I'm mean, going back a few years now, but yep. but those that type of evolution, are we expecting? I don't know, many. Do you expect to see that type of thing continue? Because animation sure, and, yeah. and gaming. Uh, I'm, I'm sure because we are the market is so huge and so diverse and so dense that we are all looking producers, the content creators, or distributors, or broadcasters of looking for new ideas. Mm. And uh, new ideas are very dangerous, <laughs> so, or more dangerous. So uh, yes, it's always good to, 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 to be grounded with, with, a, with an IP, even if it's just a book, just, sorry for the just, it's, 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 it's a book, or a video game, or anything else. So yes, I think we will, continue to have this sort of, of, uh, of adaptation. But adaptation is not a bad word. Mm. Uh, uh, and you can be a creator with an adaptation. So that's, that's not, it's not, um, I think being original is essential. Mm -hmm. And being a good scriptwriter is a key of 
to our business. And so we won't, we won't succeed in, unless we have very good content creators and script writers. Mm. Yeah. With, if it's original or adaptations. It's still at the centre. Uh, Frank, Anyways. good moment to talk to you. Let's, uh, we've only got about three minutes left, so let's do some crystal ball gazing. How do you see the industry yeah, developing? Well, I, I was just thinking about this because it kind of ties into something Peter said. Like Our, our business is so conservative and risk-averse, right? Mm. And so we just turn to IP because it's proven somewhere. And coming out of, you know, sort of the collapse of the the peak TV era and, of the, you know, in the aftermath of the strikes by the actors and the writers in the U.S. and the actors in the U.S., it feels like we're going into a more, uh, I don't know, less spending, yep. right? Smaller budgets. Um, so I think these big IP games, you know, are going to belong to the big players. I don't think you're going to see a lot of co-productions based on video games. Um, I was talking to somebody who's in the advertising agency, <laughs> advertising business, they're saying, you know, the TV business, it's all about repeating success. This is like yeah. this, this is like this. <laughs> Whereas in advertising, they're trying to break the mold. They're trying to get attention by doing something nobody's ever done yeah. before. And um, I guess, you know, while I totally believe in doing a great TV series based on a game or a great game based on a TV series or a movie, um, to sort of just sort of break with the whole premise of this panel, I, I hope that, that we're going to start to take more risks, you know, as storytellers, yeah. and, and be braver about just creating new stuff that isn't, you know, IP-based. Um, I, I, that, that's my, my hope, especially when you have uh, less money, yeah. you yeah. know, to be, to be braver with the concept. Because yeah. I, I think the audience wants to be surprised. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's the key thing. Yeah. Yeah. So when you don't have a bold enough to surprise, then you lose. That's obvious. You can, okay, when we have it at the moment, so 80% of the programming is stone old because the audience is stone old sitting there. That makes absolutely sense. But it works quite good because in Europe, most countries have a very overpopulated old group. <laughs> so, but when they are dying, then, then they are dead too. Because when you don't take the surprise, then you will never get... Uh, new audiences, and you, 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 it goes down. You, you feed the interest of these people are sitting there, and then. I mean, crystal ball gazing. Let's keep it going. Are you, could you see yourself adapting a game? Could, you know, if you, you, you see your, your son playing a game, and you think, actually, that's a really interesting premise. Or yes, I would. Yeah, so when, when I would think about something, I would like to. So. So I would like to have a video game where I could dive deep in the character and can prove out things, uh, yeah, playing yeah. with this character. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know, it could be erotic, could be psychologic. Yeah. When you see all these things which trigger young people nowadays, so that means it could be that you prove out things without trigger fear, so you can check it, so, so that it's not disturbing you so much. So I would, I don't know whether this is possible, but I would be interested in this mm -hmm. <clears throat> because soccer or tennis I can play myself, so that means this action thing is not never touching me so much. Yeah. Which is, uh, yeah. But a sort of psychological action in a video game would trigger me, so I would like to see this. Okay, <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, Helen, how do you see the, the next couple of years for Ubisoft and, and your interactions with the TV industry? Um, I honestly believe it's only going to grow because the the idea is that the um, uh, video game IPs, I truly believe, are going to be the next uh, Marvel Universe-like type yeah. IPs, honestly. And then hopefully we'll be smart enough not to bore people out like Marvel's doing those days. <laughs> <laughs> and to keep subversion of expectation <laughs> is really something uh, uh, we're yeah. trying to keep as a motto. Yep. Uh, Doing well, that, but the of subversion of expectations, my favorite sentence. Yeah, like, yeah. like, how do we keep being, do we yeah. build towards being the yeah. next Marvel yeah. universe, but without, with always managing to surprise, because I agree yeah. absolutely yeah. with you. Yeah. Otherwise, we just became lazy, and I hope we're not going to get there. We can't. 
<laughs> Emmanuel, I'll give you the last word. Let's see yeah, for media one. Yes, I would say I would say about the, the, the global market and, and the money. Uh, yeah. about the budget. Indeed, we need to, to reduce our budget because we, we have been in a bubble and uh, the bubble did not explode, but it's really deflated. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's okay. But I need to change our uh, process and maybe to share the responsibilities and include more partners in one project. So that's, I think the, the global business will be changed because IPs are expensive. Uh, production are more and more expensive, and the, the audience is very demanding. So it's okay. We need to respond to that audience, and we need to find a new way to, to produce it with the same quality, and maybe share responsibilities. So I think it's, it's out of the ways. It's uh, when we never forget that the core of our business is creation. Mm -hmm. Then we can do anything. Absolutely, and yeah, in these times of uh, yeah. these troubled times, there's always opportunities, mm -hmm. isn't there? Exactly. We are fully out of time. Uh, Emmanuel, yeah. Helen, uh, Peter, and Frank, please let's put our hands together. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.